Very excited to be here today. Uh, we're going to have a panel about ad product innovation. Uh, and before I bring them out, I want to talk a little bit about why this is important. Uh, as I think you're all very familiar, consumer attention continues to fragment across devices and channels. And that makes it very difficult for publishers to develop large strategic relationships with advertisers on, a, on an ongoing basis. Uh, the typical response for a publisher is to invest time and resource and energy in developing a new innovative ad product. Unfortunately, more often than not, these new innovations, as most innovations do, fail. So our hope today is we're going to spend some time with some experts in ad product innovation. They're going to talk a little bit about what they've learned, some best practices, maybe even a few tips and tricks to help you all be as successful as you can be with your next ad product innovation. So welcoming to the stage, I believe we have Josh Jacobs, President of Services for Kick. Good, Good to Ryan, see you. How are you? Rhiannon White, uh, VP Product Management for Ad Products at Shazam, and Russ Glass, Head of Product for LinkedIn Marketing Solutions. So let's get started. Uh, Josh, Kick has done some really interesting work with branded GIFs and emojis um, at you know, Kick. Uh, Rhiannon, Shazam is very well known for delivering unique ad products for advertisers, uh, native experiences, and, and native video in your feeds. And Russ, at LinkedIn, you really focus on uh, delivering unique data assets to be, to be marketers, uh, among other things. Um, but before we go into details on these exciting innovations, I want to take a step back and start with why. Why do we need to innovate? What's wrong with standard ads? So maybe, Rhiannon, you could get us started with your thoughts. That's a great question. <laughs> and actually having Errol go through the, the ecosystem before, that was a really interesting point around, we believe at Shazam there actually fundamentally is a place for standard ads and they are very important to our business. Innovation is also very important because it's, I think, in the continual drive and challenge to break through in terms of trying to capture people's attention. If you think about the average user, certainly when we think a lot about our users and how they interact with our product throughout the day, they don't have a lot of time and a lot of attention, really. So they have fractions of seconds, fundamentally, for that ad to, to deliver its hopefully relevant message to them. Not always, but hopefully relevant. And so innovative products help us find ways to, to help break through that competition for attention, if you like, and try and find a way that's more, that is interesting enough to entice them to explore a little bit further. So for you, innovative ad products sounds like it's as much about the user as it is the advertiser. Which is, which is great. For, absolutely. I mean, it has to be. If, honestly, if advertisers had their way, they would have us roadblocking users at every point in our app before they could get to content, which is not going to work for us because uh, you know, the users are going to disappear. So that constant tension between the advertiser needs and the user needs is something that we have to keep in mind and that when we develop new ad products, we try to balance both of them as we go gotcha. through. Gotcha. Gotcha. That, that makes a ton of sense. Um, you know, one of the things that we talked a little bit about in, in prep was the process. So, you know, we've determined we need to do this. Um, we'd be interested in your thoughts on uh, how do you get started? How do you form a team? Um, you know, Russ, I know you've been through this in a couple of different instances at Bizzo and then LinkedIn. Uh, how's the process work? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that, uh, first of all, it's... It's what problem are you trying to solve, right? Where, do you, where, where are you focused and, and where are you putting your energy? Um, you know, the, I, think, I think what I see is a lot of mistakes being made around trying to solve a problem that's too big and not really narrowing in on a focused problem. You know, a lot of entrepreneurs, they'll come and say, oh, you know, I've been advised that if it's not a $10 billion market, you know, it's not fundable. Uh, and, you know, my thought on that is that's crazy because if it's a $10 billion market you're going after, you're in a ton of trouble before you've ever gotten started, 
Right? Why, why is that? Because you don't have a narrow enough focus. Right? You can't possibly go after a $10 billion market all at once. What you need to do is pick the billion dollar portion of that market hmm. and crush it, right? Get that exactly right. And then you'll have opportunities to expand from there. Once you, once you can get that focus, right? So you have your billion dollar, dollar opportunity, you've got you know, the, the way you're gonna uniquely solve the problem, then you can go out and get the right team, focus on the right culture to solve that problem. Again, if it's too big, it's hard to get the right team to solve a $10 billion problem, right? It's, it's, it's that focus and being consistent about solving that problem, crushing that problem that gives you the sort of rights to go after a bigger problem. Gotcha. I know, Josh, you're working on some, you know, some new things that I don't even know if you can put a market size on them. Uh, you know, similar thoughts in terms of forming the team or what's, what's your process been like? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, so we're, first of all, we're, we're very, very, very user-focused. We're, Kick is a messaging platform, and if you think about messaging, it's probably, you know, maybe second to music, maybe not, but it's an incredibly intimate environment. You're talking to your friends, and bringing advertisers into an environment like that is scary, you know, sort of to begin with. Um, so for us, a lot of it, you know, really started with this question of start with the user and say where and how would a user be willing to engage with an advertiser and potentially even welcome it? And I spent enough time on the buy side of this whole thing um, to, you know, to kind of realize that as much as advertisers would love to roadblock everything, um, they also don't like the fact that people hate ads. And it's yeah. not good for a, a brand to have people tolerating them or seeing them as a nuisance. So what we've tried to focus on is building great products that users will want to use that have obvious tie-ins for advertisers to be integrated with them. And you mentioned, you know, GIFs is a great example of that. GIFs are a huge part of the language that teenagers use to communicate with each other. There's tremendous cultural relevance around that. When a new movie comes out and can distribute assets that way, they're creating content. They're not creating advertising in the minds of, of our users. And those kind of products tend to work really, really well for all parties. I mean, that's because gotcha. the movie trailer is the greatest native advert ever invented, right? I yeah, mean, people fundamentally sure. want to watch it. It's harder for brands that don't have, you know, if you don't have the Avengers in your stable, you're selling soap. It's, it's, it's a trickier proposition. Gotcha. What are, just curious for all of you, what's the biggest mistake that you've made? What's the, you know, what's the biggest challenge that you've, that you've not? past? I'll start. I mean, I, th I think this is one that, uh, you know, that, that a lot of people make. I think that the biggest mistake that people tend to make in advertising is they assume when you invent something new, the market grows. And the market doesn't grow. Money goes from one place to somewhere else because that new place does a better job of solving a problem that was being solved by something else. And so I think, you know, what I've seen the mistake be over and over again is coming to market with new ad products without a clear sense of what are people using today to solve that problem and how are you better at doing that? Um, and with a really good sense of what are the things about what they're currently buying that are important to recreate. Metrics being a great, great example mm. of that. You know, When you see Facebook give up and agree to sell on a GRP basis, you realize they're doing that because people know how to buy that and they're comfortable buying that. You need to fit into the way that they buy. Interesting. Excellent. So on, on that note, I actually want to shift gears a little bit. We're going to do a little audience and panelist participation challenge here. So I want to talk about some uh, high profile ad innovations, whether or not we think they've been successful or not. So show of hands from panelists and audience. Who thinks AOL Project Devil was a success? Okay, skeptics, great. What about cost per like advertising from Facebook? Nope. IAD? Harsh crowd? Okay, one last try. Chat roulette advertising. Okay, so Josh, thank you. So I think those are some high profile uh, examples of things that obviously this group didn't think were particularly great. What are some things that 
you know, you see have a lot of promise. There, there's a lot of companies out there that are working really hard to innovate and make some noise. Besides yourself, who's got the best chance to really make some waves? Well, there's a few thoughts here. Right? The first is, you know, in an industry like this where things are moving so quickly, uh, innovation cycles um, just are happening every, really, like, even sub-year uh, units, but, you know, certainly within year units, uh, you have to be experimenting. So while every one of those things may be viewed as sort of commercial failures, uh, I, they led to something more successful. And it's the companies that can continue to innovate and can continue to have no problem failing uh, on the way that are going to get it right ultimately. So I think that the companies, you know, back to your question, the companies that will be successful and can, can make things happen are the companies that are willing to have project devils and are, and are willing to, to you know, uh, push the envelope and figure out what's going to work, figure out what's not going to work, move quickly. And, you know, I mean, my example with LinkedIn. LinkedIn buys Bizzo. We thought two different platforms made sense. A subscription platform, a media platform. We put both in the market. And over the last year, we learned very quickly that it was going to be very complex for us to have two different platforms in the market. And so quickly pivoted to say, let's take all the great capabilities of the Bizzo platform and integrate it into a single platform and bring that single platform to market. And don't charge for that single platform, right? So I think we we were able to move quickly. I have a lot of confidence in our future because of that. And, and I think culturally, organizations that can set themselves up for that are going to be successful. I would add, I think, one other thing to that I think is an interesting example, that um, if you look at what Google did with skippable video ads, you would assume that everybody given the opportunity to just skip advertising would do so. And in fact, it's a great business for them. And I think that the notion of trusting your users, users want free, they don't want slow, um, but putting them in control, they actually not only will tolerate, they'll embrace advertising if it's done correctly. And I think that's a great example of putting the user first and actually seeing a win from it rather than seeing your users flee. Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty consistent theme. I think we're hearing from everyone, user first, user first, user first, um, which resonates with me as well, obviously. Um, so as you know, we talk about some of the things that have, have tried and failed, some of the things that are interesting, uh, that have a good shot to succeed. I think there's a lot of decisions that have to be made along the way about how open uh, you want to aspire to be. I think we just heard Errol give a really interesting take on how to make some of those decisions. Um, you know, as you all have worked on different types of ad products, how do you think about how open you want to be with the rest of the ecosystem when you get started? We think about this a lot because it, our business, Shazam, is very globally distributed. So we have about 120 million users uh, monthly, but only 20 to 25 percent of those are in the U.S. And so our, our the, the vast bulk of our users are in fact outside, and in many cases not in very developed ad markets. So we don't always have direct sales forces on the ground in those places, and we have to rely on on different arrangements. So we think a lot about. What is the right balance between something that's very bespoke and native to us and therefore closed by its very nature to the ecosystem? And then what should we be doing that should be open and is very standardized and able to be traded, if you like, through, through pipes fundamentally? So we, we think a lot about that and we make those decisions based very much on a market by market basis. So we look at the UK and the US as very, and Australia actually, as very tolerant of highly bespoke products. Um, not New Zealand. I'm not from Australia. It's New Zealand that I'm from. Just the accent. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, New Zealand is not uh, not big enough to support any of that. Uh, but then the other markets we do we do focus on actually acknowledging that standardised products do work better in those in those cases. And we're not going to roll out the you know the the highly bespoke, incredibly native, often very beautiful, and that will work for an advertiser who wants something very uh, specific. It's not going to work for the for the advertiser in Turkey who has a campaign that they want to run. Gotcha. Gotcha. Russ, I know you've been thinking about some of these things. Anything interesting you'd like to share on Yeah, so a couple, a couple quick thoughts. I mean, I think, first of all, um, there are a lot of different considerations when you think about closed versus open. Uh, the world is, is different than it used to be where open ecosystems were kind of required to get to massive scale. 
uh, because of the distribution channels, the internet, uh, the cost of getting distribution has gone down so much, you can have closed ecosystems. I think uh, from, from LinkedIn's perspective, a lot of the reason that things have to stay closed are for the members first reasons, right? The fact that you know, if we want to control that user's experience and we want to make sure that data doesn't leak out into the ecosystem, we have to have a closed ecosystem. That said, we've seen things like programmatic over the last you know, couple of years start to have the right technology and right capabilities for us to feel good about protecting member data while opening pipes up. So over the last couple of months, we've opened a lot of programmatic pipes up. We're allowing wow. buyers to come in. Uh, and you'll see more announcements from us over the coming months uh, to uh, continue to grow that. That's exciting. That's yeah, exciting. Very exciting. So it, it sounds like in addition uh, to the sort of timing and phasing of bringing in uh, open market kind of dynamics and the, the location issues as well, there are probably some technology partner decisions to make. Um, you know, AppNexus being a technology company, I'll save my remarks for after the show, but anyone have thoughts on the right way to approach that problem? Sure, I mean, I, I can chime in on that a bit. I think um, we, you know, and it, it relates to the open bit as well. We have a philosophy that is driving everything that we do around ad products that we call fit in and stand out. Hmm. And the fit in piece is, is really, really critical. Be easy to do business with. Support formats and standards that people are already creating and, you know, in, in large scale. Um, stand out for us is really bring the unique aspects of our platform to bear so that the results of our units are better than those units when you run them in other environments. And so when we look at, at evaluating technology, one of the most important things for us as a, as a jumping off point is who enables us to follow that philosophy the most closely. And being, um, you know, even simple things like accreditation with standards bodies, um, being integrated with large numbers of other partners being facilitators of moving data back and forth between different systems are all things that make it easy for us to be able to say yes to the partners that we want to do business with. Yes, we fit into your environment and can work really closely with you. So that's really our, our core starting point. That's fantastic. So before we get to tips and recommendations, uh, Russ talked a little bit about how LinkedIn is thinking about some of their plans. I don't want to, uh, I want to give you both an opportunity to share anything you want with the audience about what's next for you, um, anything you'd like to share with the audience about what you're working on. Well, this is a, it's a very weird uh, <laughs> place to be talking about this for me, but um, messaging um, is uh, having a, a really, really interesting year. Um, I think we're gonna all spend the year talking about bots. And hmm. it's weird to be at an advertising conference saying bots are great, but <laughs> bots are great. Um, completely different story, and hopefully this will be a year where we stop thinking about them as uh, nasty uh, scamming tools so, and, and our new buddies that help us do great things with uh, Messaging bots. Messaging bots. Versus botnets. Versus botnets. Okay, well, I'm pretty exactly. excited to hear about that. Uh, Rhiannon, what have you got cooking? For us, the big focus this year is really around taking data that's very unique to us. So we have, if you like, very deep data about our users, but very narrow. We know a lot about what people like in terms of music and how they interact with that in their lives. So it's very narrow, but very deep. So we haven't done much with it up until now. And this year, we're going to be very focused on developing insights out of that that help advertisers understand their audiences better and use that as a, as a, as a way of improving our ad product suite without increasing the ad load. Awesome. So lightning round, last question. Uh, most important recommendation that you would like everyone to take away today about how to maximize your odds of success when you're doing a new innovation. Understand the problem that you're trying to solve um, for the advertiser and do so in a way that your users will actually embrace it. Gotcha. Rhiannon? I completely agree with Josh. And fundamentally, using, using the data that you have at your fingertips around your users and around what's worked and not worked in the past to inform that problem will get you through the hard conversations internally. Awesome. Make sure you have the right people in the right roles. Got it. That works in a lot of situations. <laughs> awesome. 
Okay, well listen, I think we've heard some uh, really interesting insights about the process and the challenges, a couple of things that I picked up on that were you know, really kind of universal and pervasive. Uh, focus on the user. Starts with the user. I think that goes really nicely with the virtuous cycle that Brian started our, our, our day with in the keynote. Um, Josh, you talked a little bit about thinking in advance about metrics that work later, once the market is a little bit more at scale and being easy to work with, with accreditations and things like that. I mean, I think that's really, really awesome. And then, uh, Rhiannon, you also talked about thinking you know, well in advance about how different markets are gonna, are gonna be interested in and tolerate sort of different configurations of open and closed, uh, programmatic and not, you know, highly standardized and, and highly custom. And I thought that was a really great one too. So um, you also all heard their you know, number one recommendation for how to make your innovations a success. Uh, so with that, thank you all very much. Thank you to the panelists. And we're gonna hand it back to Brian. Thanks everybody. Thank you.